This is me. Thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is Enrique Lopez Mañas. Don't try to pronounce it. It's really hard, unless you can roll your tongue. And um, I'm uh, originally from Spain, but I live in, uh, in Germany, in München, since 10 years now. And I'm um, an I'm independent consultant and part of the Google Expert program. And today I'm going to talk about Android high performance. How many of you deal with performance topics on Android on a frequent basis? Nice. How many people here are Android developers? Okay, so I, I hope you can benefit from this. And the people that are not Android developers, I'm, I'm sure you will also benefit from the talk. So how did this start? Uh, now, uh, more than a year ago, Pact, the publishing company, contacted me and asked me if I, I wanted to write a book. And as always in life, I, I say yes and then regret it. I think that's, that should be the standard approach always, to say yes and then see how, why you got into that trouble. So, um, well, it was very interesting because they said that we want to write a, a, top, a book on high performance and um, I, I never really dealt with high performance on a specific basis. So I had to think about what do I want to write and um, I had to test a lot of my assumptions, like compiling code to see if, uh, you know, when you're compiling enums is more effective than using static classes, etc. the compiling the files. And I learned a lot during the process. So the book is actually uh, published if you want to take a look. What is performance? Because now I think it's a very frequent topic. You uh, read very frequently about performance in, in many platforms, not only Android. And the definition of performance is how well a person, machine, etc., does a piece of work or an activity. That's the Cambridge definition. But what is high performance? Because it's maybe something different. Well, when we talk about high performance, we talk about the strategies to create efficient software. And there are many top topics, especially when it comes to mobile. We talk about energy and battery. This is correlated. The more energy we use, the less battery we will have. And a mobile application is, in a sense, different from a desktop one because we have this limited source of uh, computational uh, uh, sources and, and batteries. not like in a, in a desktop apl application. There are some things you don't really have to, to think of, such as the network connections. They can be as much as you need. You're generally assuming that you will be connected on a Wi-Fi network. Etc. We also have a, a programming pattern, so we want to develop software that is going to be efficient over time. One of the things I have discovered in my career is uh, when you try to advocate for uh, these kind of strategies, and you, you generally talk with your managers and say, okay, we want to refactor, we want to uh, implement this new architecture, and generally a manager doesn't understand those things. So I try to say, we're going to save money if we do this. If you talk about money, Generally, managers say, oh, OK, then let's going to do that. Because when you tell them, by implementing this architecture, we will be able to develop our features faster. And instead of two weeks, we will need one. They start understanding, OK, then I'm going to save more money. I will have better holidays at the end of the year. It's, uh, well, it's also about layouting. When we are constructing our, our screens, we need to make them efficient. And we want to render them very fast. It's about security. We want our data to be protected. We don't want that anybody access our data or steals it, because then there are compensations, and we have to deal with uh, angry clients. Multi-threading, also very important. Generally, we will have a, a set of tasks that are being performed, and we want to make them efficient. We want to communicate one thread with the other. And debugging techniques. Debugging techniques are, uh, well, when we're developing our software, we have a set of tools that are available to us. And in my experience as an independent developer, I, I do a lot of consulting, sorry, consulting. That means I go to a company, I stay with them maybe two weeks, I see what they do, and I tell them how can they do that better. So sometimes I sit with a lot of programmers, I see how they debug and use the, the tools we have. And I do not think in Android most of the people exploit the full potential of the DSDK. Why is important the high performance? Well, it's about user engagement, costs, as I mentioned, maintenance and quality. And everything is correlated. If our application is, uh, is maintainable, generally means that the cost will be lowered, we don't need to rewrite the application every two years, etc. We can actually have, when I mention about cost, that's uh, always the thing you need to to put into perspective. And uh, when we are not developing performance software, we can have many financial losses. It can come from a lost business, so that's a client that doesn't hire us or doesn't use our software. From customer reparations, if you remember the case of Sony, 
a few years ago, well, and, well it, and it happens all the time, um, some hackers stole information from, from Sony and they had to pay to some of the users because you know some of this information was credit cards, the hackers were using the credit cards, and uh, that can lead to a, to a massive amount of money. Uh, lost customers, people that are, um, are using our services and they quit, lawsuits, you know, the, is there any lawyer in the room? Okay, that's good. So, well, you know, lawyers generally um, uh, prevent of doing a lot of things by, uh, you know, um, um, overprotecting, in my opinion, uh, uh, companies from uh, litig litigations and future problems, and that a, a, lot, a lot of money actually goes into those problems. And of course, we will have we can have a lower brand equity for our organization. When it comes to software responsiveness, there are three very important limits. One is 0 0.1 seconds. That's the amount of time that the user perceives as immediate. If uh, everything happens, something is happening under 0 0.1 seconds, the user will not perceive any lag. If it happens in uh, between uh, under one second, the user is able to perceive this lag. So the user sees, uh, okay, this is, there is something going in. The, the, the information is not coming back immediately to me. And 10 seconds is the number where everything stops, the user loses focuses and starts another application or lose the context. This was actually published in a, in, a, in a couple of papers. If you want to Google for them, you can download them for free. They are uh, available to the public. And uh, it's an entire, uh, the, it, uh, an entire literature on, on responsiveness and how, to, how people should deal with software and the relationship between software speed and, uh, and user engagement. I recommend you to read them. They're very fast reads. What this means in Android? A and R. Does anybody know what this means? What that means? Excuse me? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, as pro most of you will know, it's uh, application non responding. And it's this uh, nasty dialogue that uh, came from time to time saying that the, the application is, uh, is not uh, responding to our interaction. Does anybody know when this happens? When? Yeah, but in which particular situation? Yeah. That's so good. So when we have click and uh, the system tries to trigger an input event and doesn't happen in five seconds, we get the inner. And when a broadcast receiver is still executing, after 10 seconds, we get the, the a inner. How can we avoid it? There are a few methods. We can. Um, perform everything on a background operation. If they were performing things on background operations, we need to show feedback. We have this progress bar by default in Android. We have also the circular one. And uh, in general, we should always let the user know that something is being done on the background, not just doing it uh, um, uh, on a hidden way. The splash screens. There is some love and hate regarding the splash screens. They are not a recommended uh, solution for Android, but they do make sense in many contexts. You don't need to take uh, the, uh, the uh, Android patterns as a Bible. There, uh, you, you will have many problems, and you can solve problems in different ways. This uh, example from here is an example of a very beautiful implemented uh, splash screen. In some times, it happens we need to fetch data from the, from the server. It's like that uh, due to our business uh, model or architecture. And presenting uh, things on in an interactive way that goes very smoothly is a very nice way to do it. Also, if you check uh, Uber, the application, they have a very beautiful splash screen. So this can be done if it's done in a good way. If you're using calculations, you should use also a worker thread. Uh, so it's uh, if uh, generally, I guess most of the people here will be using a proper architecture in uh, using a MVP or these kind of uh, patterns or architectures. And any long-term operation should always be performed on a worker thread. There are a few tools we can actually use to debug the, uh, the, these problems on performance. And um, there are two actually, SysTrace and TraceView, that can be done in Android. Is there any person that do not know them? OK, that's good. And well, when it comes to Android debugging, we have the DDMS. I uh, had to restart my computer, but I can open it again. If, well, if you have uh, Android, you can always Android Studio, you can always go to uh, Tools, Android. Starting the Android device monitor. I actually run a, on my Twitter. I run a poll every every Monday with a random question. So, do you use a language different than Java, like Kotlin or Scala, for example? And many people interact with them. And one of my questions um, a few months ago was, which environment do you use? And I was surprised to see that I think it was more than 10% of the people was still using Eclipse, which in 2016 is weird. 
And well, if you, uh, you probably, most of you know the, the DDMS that uh, we have a, a few interesting things here that we can check out. So uh, if uh, you haven't used it or you haven't used it intensively, you can debug threads. So uh, in this uh, uh, screen, we can see the threads that are running. We can stop them. We can see the, uh, the variables they are using here in heap and in allocation tracker. We could uh, store a thread from an application, see exactly which kind of objects are we dealing with. We can access to the network statistics. There is some, uh, I think I explained it later, there is a very important point in the network statistics and is that uh, we can actually tag our sockets. So if we are dealing with uh, an application and we want to track different parts of the traffic, we can tag them and here it will be drawn with different colors. We have also the file explorer that you know, we can uh, use to access the emulator and from the emulator control we can simulate a bunch of things. So the telephony status, actions, etc. And now back to the presentation. Yeah, so this is uh, pretty much what I saw before. This is what I work. Uh, uh, I talked about the, the traffic. We can uh, make a tag where you see the 0xf00d. It accepts a, a float, so we can specify the, the, uh, how do we want to tag our different threads and then access them um, uh, like this. So in this case, uh, there is only one, uh, one thread, but we see that if there would be different ones, we will paint them with different colors. That's very useful when you're having a problem with networking and you don't know where, uh, when, from where that is coming and how to debug it. That's a, this is an excellent tool. Layouts. So... Uh, yeah, we have the, the TV, uh, there are two standards, the uh, American, European ones, Americans, you know, always make things differently, like Fahrenheit and uh, different frame rates. Uh, the new encoders um, can um, record up to 48 frames per second, a little bit more for slow motion. Still, blur can occur with those frames per second, but when it comes to apps, you know, they are drawing everything on 60 frames per second. To put it on perspective, Every 60 milliseconds, you need to draw content. So the, your application really needs to be very responsive. This is how a layout hierarchy looks like in Android. Can anybody think of an immediate improvement we can apply here? Yeah, I see the resolution is not the best one. Well. I can uh, save you the search. Do you see the, the core view up there? The core view is the, the main node, the node from where everybody came, like the heaven node, the one up there. Uh, so this one over here. Okay, so what's uh, the core view? Does anybody know? That's right, that's the holder we have for all the views. But what happens in Android? We normally occupy this, the core layout because we have our own background and our own layouts. So in most of the cases, we don't need it. And this is just being redrawn every time with each screen. So one of the immediate improvements we can make on our applications is removing the decor view. If we're gonna have our on um, background, which I think it happens 99% of the cases, you just can use this thing of your, on your resource file and your, or your application will slightly earn on performance because you are not redrawing something that always goes into the, sec into the background. Reducing layouts. We can, uh, we can also reduce um, some layouts. Uh, there are some techniques that Android offers us. Let's think of this one. This is a linear layout. We have a few things inside. Uh, traditionally or typically in our applications, we will have something that gets repeat over time. So uh, Android gives us two possibilities to reduce them via XML files. One is to use the include layout. That means it, we will take the layout and put it into the, uh, reduce it into the, the target one. And then there is a merge layout. Does anybody know what means Merge? Excuse me? Yeah, it's, that, that's a good definition, yeah. So pretty much we, we, get, uh, we get right as well of uh, duplicities in the code. So if uh, we see that uh, this layout will be introduced in a, a redundancy, it will be removed with the use of merge. View stuff. How many people did use view stuff before? Okay. 
If you haven't used it, view stub is something that doesn't get drawn until you specify it. So it, it comes very handy when, it, uh, when we want to make our uh, application more performant because sometimes, or it's very often, you draw the things and you make them invisible. But this is still in the hierarchy and it needs to be considered there. Even when you're making the visibility gone, the thing is being drawn or it's, uh, it's kept on the hierarchy. So the Android needs to take consideration of that in its iteration. Each time it's trying to redraw a framework. If you use view stuff, then using one of those methods, inflate a visibility, it, you put it later into the screen. So this also makes your application more performant. So uh, here we have a couple of examples on how we would uh, inflate the, the view stuff. And uh, to, recommend, to uh, debug layouts and uh, see how it is performing, we have this tool called Hierarchy Viewer. Uh, if you don't know it, you can also access it from the DDMS menu. And it's also very convenient, especially when you're, um, the problem I, I find more, uh, more often is uh, when you are dealing with recycler views and this kind of content that is drawn dynamically. Because normal screens, you generally know how they're going to appear. You, you see them on, the, on the, this template builder and you, you play with them. But uh, with things as list views or recy recycler views, you don't really play with them until they're being drawn. And that's when the performance problems are coming. If you connect your device and uh, use the hierarchy viewer, you're able to see exactly what's being drawn. If there are too many nested hierarchies, and then you can take a decision on whether you want to remove something or not. Also, if you know the, um, the, uh, the developer modes in the phone, there are a few options you can ac uh, make active. I like this one, the profile GPU rendering, because you can visually see uh, the time that you're needing in order to paint different contents on the, on the screen. There are a, f a few colors here. I don't remember them uh, by heart. But they mean something like the blue is the time you need to draw, the purple, the time you need to prepare, red, the, the time you need to process, and orange, the time you need to execute. So if we came back, we can see if we're having any, any, any hole or any bottleneck in our application. Memory. Memory is the ability to remember information experiences and people. This is also from Cambridge. Enumerations. Are enumerations good or bad? That's good, because if not, I would not show them here, right? Well, they make sense. So enumerations are uh, human readable, and we read them and understand them. It's closer um, to our mindset and our mind model than that, uh, that other solutions. But they have some problems when they're being compiled. When we have something uh, uh, like, like this enum, it actually, and the enums can be associated with an integer, for example, you actually need to save two variables in memory, then the, the enum itself and then the value it corresponds to. You could say, well, but uh, is this a big problem? Well, if it's not a big problem by itself, but at the end you need to tackle a lot of things together. And software, is about, software development is about handling increasing complexity. The hello world is always going to work, but you want to make a software that is going to last for a few years and is going to be uh, performant and you don't want to rewrite it every few years. So you need to take all those little actions every day. Let's going to think of a different solution. So this, uh, this public class contains a set of uh, static integers named rectangle, triangle, square, and circle that could be used also to represent uh, a model. So we have the num, we have the, the statics. You could say, ah, but I don't really want to be dealing with, because uh, the statics are not very readable, are not like enums. That's right, I give you right. But we can apply a solution. Let's think of uh, how, for example, this, um, uh, in this case, we could, uh, yeah, this is how, for example, we would be calculating the surface, right? We have a switch, we get the shape, we go through all the different values. And uh, this is how it would, work with the uh, static bar. So we have the cal uh, calculate surface functions that receives an integer, we iterate through the value, and then we apply a solution or the other. So I agree that this one would be more readable than this one, when, especially when it gets more complex. But we have an annotation called indef in Android. Does anybody know it? Good. So for those who don't know it, indef allows us to do things such as this thing from here. If you see it now, I'm creating an interface called shape, where I'm defining a few values. And those values are the ones that are being represented by static values. So now it starts being more readable. And uh, now I could use the indef annotation like this. I could set it, uh, send it as a, inside a function, 
or I could uh, uh, use the annotation here in front of the function to specify that that's going to be a safe model. So if you're going to use enumerations next time, think that you can use in depth, and it will help you in the long term with your performance. As a summary, the enumerations make unnecessary allocations. You should avoid using them. It's not going to be an immediate improvement, but in the long term, it might count. I remember one of the companies I was uh, consulting with, they had like, well, something huge. It was a, a, um, something like really big. Uh, they, I think they had like a few millions of lineages of code, so it, it was an amazing piece of code. And they had a lot of enumerations, and some performance problems were happening because of that. And um, if you have the chance, uh, use static final integer values with the in-depth annotation. Also with the constants, the constants should always be static uh, to take advantage of the uh, memory savings and to avoid uh, initialization in the Java compiler. By doing this, you can, you can also uh, save a few bytes. The strings, are the strings good or bad? Yeah. Well, are required, we need them, that's, that's a problem. Well, we can apply some, uh, some uh, improvements on the string. This is how typically we will create an, uh, an a string. The above model will be a little bit uh, less performant than just assigning the, the string uh, directly, the literal. But we can make it more efficient. If uh, we are going to use an, a string, uh, we could use an, a string buffer. So the string buffer, uh, we pretty much can specify a, a size, etc. And uh, by doing this, what you have up you will also save a, a few bytes of memory every time you're, or a few pieces of memory every time you're creating a, a, a string. It can also be further improved. If we know the, the amount of space we need for the, string, for the string, we can specify it on the constructor. Here you see that I have specified 64. Sometimes you know how, much, uh, how big a string is going to be. So you can send it as a, as a parameter. If not, the string buffer doubles every time you need to, create, to add new strings. So it starts with 16 bytes or uh, 16 uh, 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 characters, then it doubles to 32, 64, 128, etc. Memory leaks. A memory leak is a type of resource leak that occurs when a computer program incorrectly manages memory allocations in such a way that memory which is no longer needed is not released. That's the Wikipedia definition, because in Cambridge there was nothing for a memory leak. Well, static fields. Here we have a static field. Can anybody think of a problem of using static fields? Yeah. Yeah, because I was telling about that. <laughs> well, the problem when we are using static views, and, and many people actually use them, because they say, ah, oh, it's very easy to use static views. Yeah, it's, it's also very easy. You put everything in the same file, but it's not going to take you very long. Well, the problem if you see the constructor here is that we need to send the context all the time, uh, every time we are creating a new view. So if we are using a static bar, the context is being passed all the time, and the, the application is not going to be clean when you need to kill the activity or something is happening. There, there will always be a dependency there. So um, also, when you are using those uh, non-static inner classes, here, um, um, can you think of another problem here that, uh, that is happening? That's right. So we have the same problem. The syntax is running, then the activity gets collected, and uh, we try to collect all the variables, but there is a mutual reference. They're never going to get collected, and then the memory leak starts. And this can leave, I mean, if you, you, this is just an example. I don't think many people use a syntax in 2016 either. We have other solutions, but it's just to prove the example that by doing this, you can run in trouble. And let's say a syntax, if you remember, they were heavily used to download images, so there can be like an image that is in memory and is not being collected, and this can matter. At the end, you can end up with a few megabytes in memory that you're not using, and they can kill your application. So one of the solutions you can apply are weak references. Does anybody know what a weak reference is? Okay. Well, you have a few more types. Also, you have soft references and phantom references, uh, but weak references is the, the one I want to showcase here. The weak reference pretty much says, that uh, if uh, it's not how the, the, mem the garbage collector works, it's if uh, it, it tries to collect all the time everything that has not been uh, referenced. When the weak reference, as soon and there is, as there is no dependency, the garbage collector will take it. So we ensure that uh, leaks are not going to happen by using them. Threading. Threading is a method of hair removal originating in Asia. 
That's the Wikipedia definition, but obviously we don't need this one. Threading is the smallest sequence of program instructions that can be managed independently by a scheduler. This also came from Wikipedia. Well, in Android, there are a lot of options to use uh, regarding threading and multi-threading. We have a syntax, we have loaders also back in the time, we have threads. The important thing here is that you need to know your work. There are different options and there are different scenarios you want to solve. The async task, it communicates with the worker, uh, the worker thread with the UI. Traditionally, it was always okay to download some image from the internet and uh, display everything on a progress bar, etc., without blocking the, the UI. Still, they are widely misused. As a rule of thumb, if you do not need to communicate with the UI and you do not need to notify the user, you do not need an async task. So think before applying it. Am I gonna update my screen? If the answer is no, don't consider the async task. And also, if, if you've been uh, developing uh, for, I, I see very often, or I saw very often, that the async task has all the parameters as void. You know, you have this template with three parameters and all of them are void. Then you don't need an async class. You're just using the uh, doing background method and you can do it with another thing, such as a thread, for example. A syntax loader, does anybody know it? Okay. Well, it can be also useful. It's, uh, it, it's pretty much used to fetch and retrieve data from the internet and it's exactly as an asyntas, but it's activity lifecycle independent. So if we, don't, we do not want to connect it with the activity lifecycle and we want the, the thread to be running on, on its own, we can use an asyntas loader. And this is how it would work. We pretty much have this loading background method, a few more that we can extend, but this one will be the, the useful one, pretty much like the doing background from the asyntas. Services. Services are not threads. Many people think a service is a thread, maybe because in Unix we have services and, and we call them services and then they, they act as threads, but not in Android. They are executed in the UI thread by default. We need to specify if we want to run them in another thread. You should never start them for a long running operation. And they also have its own life cycle, such as an activity or a fragment. Then we also have internet services. They are the particular implementation of a service they execute, execute operations sequentially in the background. And the good thing with the intent services is that we do not, they don't need to handle the life cycle. They are totally independent. Well, the last chapter, networking. Networking is the process of communication between different terminal nodes to exchange data. That's my definition because there was no Wikipedia site on the topic. Best practices. When it comes to networking, I guess you use probably things such as uh, uh, retrofit, probably uh, with um, OK, HTTP, and, and this kind of architecture. There are a, a few different things, but that's, that's more or less what seems to be the standard thing in Android. But uh, still, you can apply a few things to improve it. You know what's latency gouging? Anybody here familiar with the topic? OK. Well, when we want to download data, we, uh, in general, we just ask to the, to the Wi-Fi or to the, our network manager to give us what we want to get. It can be an image, it can be whatever operation. That can be improved. If you want to download, for example, images, you could apply this strategy here. If you watch at this piece of code, we see the network connection we have at the moment, the type. It can be Wi-Fi. If it's mobile, it can be LTE or GPRS. And based on this policy, we can de decide to apply different decisions. If we are going to download, for example, images, I'm not going to do it on GPRS because it's not going to happen and it's going to take a lot of time and the user is going to be frustrated. So you could eventually say, okay, if you're on GPRS, use my uh, thumbnail or my placeholder that I already have it locally. And if I'm on my Wi-Fi, then try to download uh, all the images. I personally have a, a library that I, I use personally and implement these kind of solutions and I can tell you it's, it's great. Batch connections. This is something used typically from uh, in frameworks such as uh, Google Analytics. Instead of making a request all the time, you can wait, collect all the information you want and send it. The advantage is that you're gonna save battery and you're gonna save, uh, therefore, uh, also um, um, internet uh, packets and, and, and internet connection. Sometimes you don't need to send the information immediately because you don't need to have this responsiveness. So in that case, you can also say, okay, I'm gonna create my queue, I'm gonna pack everything, and then I'm gonna fire it every, whatever, one hour or when you need it. You can also prefetch information. 
This is actually connected with the first point I mentioned, the latency gouging. If you see you're connected on Wi-Fi and at some point you know you're going to download any kind of content, you can try to do it at that moment so the user doesn't have to wait when you have to do it. Think of a profile for a user. You have to download an image or if you have to download several images if you're in a, let's say, a, think of an Instagram application, for example. When you connect to the Wi-Fi, that's not going to be a problem for the user because it's going to be done in the background. You're probably not going to steal a lot of the bandwidth. So it's, uh, it's also a very good practice to apply. Queuing connection. Do you know this uh, queue uh, class from, uh, from Java? Yeah. It's another, uh, uh, another possibility. When you're going to make a connection, you can queue them. You can queue all the requests and then uh, uh, execute them uh, when the conditions are, are optimal for that. You can also catch responses. There are many options to catch. So uh, here there is a very rudimentary one. When we know that uh, something is, uh, is going to be valid on the long term, we can uh, send uh, an HTTP header that says, OK, this is, has been updated, has not been updated. You can save it in a file. If you're using Picasso for image downloading, for example, you can specify Picasso, please cache all the images. That's also a very good strategy. Or uh, using this last modified. That's a header. It's a uh, standard header that we can send with our HTTP request to specify that the content had, uh, had changed. So we don't need to. Um, make the request all the time and get the latest data. Sometimes the latest data is not that relevant and we can specify when it changes. An exponential back off. So sometimes we are trying to connect to a service and we get this 500 or we get a timeout and we keep on trying, as such as in, um, it will work out at some point. Well, if uh, you had that response for several times, it's very likely that the service will be down. So it's a uh, loss of uh, energy and uh, internet to, try to fetch the data. You, you know it's not there, and you know it didn't work the last time. So this exponential backoff pretty much takes an initial time, and it doubles it, or there are different uh, approaches to the, to the strategy. The idea is that if I try and it's not working, I will try n times more, doubling the time between connections, because I know very likely it will be down. And uh, this, this is also a strategy that uh, is very nice to apply. It doesn't take a lot of, uh, of time to uh, include in, a, in an architecture and can definitely lever up the quality of uh, your app and the system you're working with. Well, I think that's uh, everything. I would love to have uh, your feedback on the talk. So I have prepared this URL here. For everybody that leaves me constructive feedback, it can be also negative as long as it's constructive. I will give you a copy on a, of another book I, I wrote. I will send you a, a link to, uh, to download it. And down there is my Twitter handle. So if you want to ask me any question, I will publish later as well the slides there. Feel free to, to write me. I try to be active on the platform. Well, thanks a lot. You've been a fantastic public. And uh, if you have any questions. <laughs>